So awesome. Father, we thank you that we're a special people, um, not because of our education or our background or our culture or our, the place of birth or our history. We're not, it's not, that's not what puts us together. That's not the common ground. The common ground is that through the blood of Jesus, you've released us and you've set us free and you've liberated us. And Lord, you've made promises uh, about us, your people, your family, your community. And those two things bind us together in your purposes and in your plan. And Lord, as we've been trying to just hear your word on, on your purpose for us as individuals, today we ask that you would show us again the beautiful purpose you have with us as a people, as the church, the bride of Christ the temple in which you live, the body of Jesus himself here on earth. Lord, what a privilege to be part of that community and people. And as we look into your word this morning, Lord, just, just, we can just briefly begin to talk about this. I pray for revelation beyond what I say. Holy Spirit, open our eyes to see how beautiful, how special, and how powerful the church of Jesus Christ really is in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been doing a, a, a series, if you haven't got a little green book, it's not a passport, but it is a, um, we've got the, uh, some books if you need them. It's got six weeks um, of Sunday preaching, midweek kind of videos and questions and answers and then devotions. How good have those devotions been? It's helpful, right? It's, it's really put together well. So today uh, I want to remind us that we started this series with that verse in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, that says we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. It's an amazing verse that God created us for a purpose and even the work that He's got for us to do in this life, He's involved in it. Uh, everything that he's got for us to do, he's involved in it and he's prepared. And we said that purpose starts with God's work, his handiwork. Um, so many people who uh, we, were involved in a small little building project or renovation. And um, when you speak to a tiler or a, a, a builder or someone, they take such pride in their handiwork. That is the thing that they, they, they sell themselves on. And if you look at God and you just look at creation... And you see his incredible handiwork as we drive through Golden Gate now twice on the way to Lesotho in uh, two weeks. Just amazing, God's handiwork. And then to know that I am part of his handiwork is an awesome thing. It's an awesome thing. God has purpose for your life purely because you're born and he's given you that life. And even though sin has taken us out of the purpose of God through Christ, where his handiwork and he has a purpose for us. Now, purpose is Christ. We said in week one, these five lanes that we, we, we're running in, my purpose is Christ-likeness. And today, we're talking about my purpose is community. One way to help us understand this purpose is um, to understand God's purpose in it. For example, if you read uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9 to 10, you see that God's plan is to bring everything into unity under the headship of Jesus. Can you see that? That's God's purpose. He's given us Jesus to unite, to bring together, to put all that together. And therefore, our purpose is Christ. So I give myself to Christ, to know Him, to serve Him, to love Him, because that's how God brings us into unity. Uh, in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, we see that his purpose and plan has always been to conform us into the image of, of His Son, Jesus. And that's why we give ourselves to Christ's likeness, because it's God's purpose for us. Today we look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. And it says, God's purpose was that now through the church, can you say the church? And I know we've had many chats about this, because we are the church. And so this is my favorite thing I'm going to preach today because you don't come to church and God doesn't live in a building. The building is not the church. Together we are the church. Together, not singular, together. And we'll see it from this verse. 
through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Isn't that amazing? For God to show off his wisdom, his multifaceted wisdom, what he does is he gives the world Well done. Letha's listening. He gives the world the church. And the church displays his manifold wisdom. And so we were saying, even in the prayer meeting this morning, sometimes as the church, you know, we say, Lord, give us Sunningdale. Give us Phoenix. Give us uh, Glen Ashley. Give us, uh, where are you from anyway? Whatever you, wherever you're from. But I think that God has a different mindset about this. God's saying, like, you know what? what you know what I'm going to give Phoenix? The church. You know what I'm going to give Sunningdale? The church. You know what I'm going to give him Floaty? You know what I'm going to give? I'm going to give Ilova momentum. I'm going to give them city life. I'm going to give them the church. A different way of thinking about it. And as God gives the church to the world, it shows off His manifold wisdom and glory. There's two words there that's important. The first one is church, and it's the word ecclesia, which means it's a collective word. The called out ones, not the called out one. That wouldn't make sense. You can't be the church on your own. I'm the called out one. It's uh, the called out ones. It's a collective. And so as much as we've been talking about our our purpose individually and discovering it, we have to understand that there is a collective purpose for the church. And if we don't understand the collective purpose for the church, our individual purpose doesn't make sense in the bigger picture. And so that word um, is followed by the word manifold. And it's the Greek word, you know that the New Testament was written in Greek, and that word is poikikos. Which means, it's actually Afrikaans word that they put in the Greek language for some reason. But that word, polypoikilos, which means, it simply means the, the multifaceted, multicolored, multi-splendor wisdom of God through the called out ones of God. And so even though we're very unique and we're individuals, there's a collective purpose that we have. And we have to understand our life in the context of that collective purpose. And one of the good ways to understand this is when you look at the, the history of Israel in the Old Testament. Before the Exodus, you read about individual families. Isn't it? Noah and his family. And then after that, after the Exodus, you read about the people of Israel. You read about a collective, the, the people of Israel. And what binds them together is those two things. One is the liberating act of God as He takes them out of Egypt through the blood of the Lamb. That's now what makes them one people. Not that they are born from a, a, a specific place or that they yes they are descendants from Jacob but they are those that have been bought with the blood of the lamb that's what knits them together and that gives them a, a, a collective purpose to display God's wisdom and glory to the world around them but the second thing that 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 gives them purpose is the promises that God makes over them it's a beautiful thing he makes these beautiful promises about a land of milk and honey and a future and, and all of this and all the promises is what knits them together. And so it's the same thing for us, even though we come from many different backgrounds, many different cultures, many different stories, the actually the thing that knits us together is that we were liberated by the blood of Jesus to become one people and the promises God has made over us for the future. It's a beautiful thing. And so today I'm hoping that we can just look a little bit at this, the, the glory of the church, the manifold wisdom of the church, because I think for many people today, they've devalued the sense of community. We're not talking about community uh, in the way that the world talks about it. You cannot, we're talking about Christ's community, the called out ones, the ones saved by the blood of the Lamb that carry the purposes of God. Is that all right? Hallelujah.
Nice, Elred. Hey, you got competition from the back. Nice. Ah, you're a lively bunch. So, I think if you see the church the way Jesus sees the church, it'll change your, your attitude and your, um, the way that we live out the word church. And so hopefully this morning we can just look at that a little bit. The first thing that we have to understand about the community of Jesus or the church is that she's the bride of Christ. She's the bride of Christ. And if we've got our Bibles, we can go to Ephesians chapter 5. Otherwise, you can just lift your head and look at the screen. But it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. There's a beauty that Jesus sees in the church. That if you don't see that beauty, it's very unlikely for you to invest your life into it. There is a love in the life of Jesus, and she's called the church. You know, when people fall in love, they surrender their schedules, their finances. They move it all around. I'm sure you, you have your own story, but when Renal and I met, I can remember I had a little, it was only a 50cc motorbike, and I lived at, on the bluff in the naval base. And uh, that Maiden Wharf Road, you know, the trucks there, when it rains, I could almost catch a barrel if you know what that is, if you're a surfer, you'll know exactly what I mean as I'm riding next to it. But I would do that road. I don't know how many rail crossings. Go and visit her, chat till 2 in the morning. Get on the 50cc. Took me two minutes to get to the bluff on that thing. Go, and it got up at 6 in the morning, go to work. Just your time, your schedule, your everything changes when you fall in love. And I think sometimes when we look at the church and we don't understand that actually this is the bride of Jesus Christ, we don't see the value the same way that Jesus sees it. Isn't it amazing? I was talking in Lesotho to a, 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 it's a funny story. I was talking to couples about marriage. And as I finished pouring my heart out to them, they all stood up, and one lady literally smacked her husband behind the head. And she said, this is a true story. She said it was a mosquito. So I believed her. I just, it's the strangest thing for me. But I was saying to them, isn't it amazing that the Bible actually starts with, with a marriage, Adam and Eve. And it finishes with a marriage, the wedding of the Lamb. And the Bible is, is, is a love story between Jesus and the people that he loves all the way through and if church for us is not if we don't see it in that way we'll never invest ourselves we'll never value it jesus is not committed to the church because he has to be it's because he wants to be committed to her there are four things you know when when god took israel out of egypt four little things that he said there in exodus chapter 6 and he said, uh, the first thing was, I will take you out. He said, I will rescue you. I will redeem you. And I will take you with me. Isn't that a beautiful thing? And you see, many people write off the church because we are full of mistakes. We are. And we'll get to that in a moment. But I want to say this. Please remember, she's the bride of Jesus Christ. In Ezekiel, it's a beautiful um, picture in chapter 16. If we read those verses from verse 9 to 14, it says, I bathed you with water. I put ointments on you. I clothed you with an embroidered dress and put sandals of fine leather on you. I dressed you. This is Jesus or, or God speaking about Israel and, and how he treated her, his people, called out people. I dressed you in fine linen, covered you with costly garments. I adorned you with jewelry. I put bracelets on your arm. 
a necklace around your neck, a ring in your nose, earring on your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. And you became very beautiful and rose to be a queen. And your fame spread among the nations on account of your beauty because the splendor I had given you made your beauty perfect. You know why the church is beautiful is because he makes her beautiful. He makes her beautiful. And I think the best way we can, we can be a blessing to Jesus is to be faithful to Jesus as our bridegroom in our generation. To love him with the same devotion and commitment that he has loved us. To respond with obedience and commitment is the way we love God. Our purpose is is to be the bride of Jesus. And I just want to remind us of that this morning. Amen? The second thing that's amazing about the church is that actually the church is the temple of God. And we see that in Ephesians chapter 2. And so I'm saying to you, your purpose is not only Christ, Christ likeness, but also your purpose is community. You're, you are created, you are made for this, to be part of the community of God's people. And why is that? Because Christ sees the church as his bride. And uh, we might look at ourselves and say, well, Lord, what is there to us to attract you? I, I don't know. But somehow he makes her beautiful and his manifold wisdom is being displayed by his grace and his love and his provision and his protection and that he pours out on his called out ones together. Beautiful. So we are the temple of the Lord, and uh, I encourage you, read your Old Testament, and uh, just have a look at how important and what a big role the, the tabernacle and then the temple of God played in, in the daily lives of people. And uh, we see in Ephesians chapter 2 in the New Testament, there's a change. You are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ himself, the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together. Can you say joined together? And rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together. Can you say built together? To become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Now, this is so important that we have, um, we give fines if you say I'll go to church here. Yeah. <laughs> At City Life. Why? Because actually you, ca you can't go to church. You are the church. The church gathers. The church is the, the, the temple. You see, uh, in the Old Testament, the only place where the very presence of God was, was in the temple. It was five meters by five meters, the Holy of Holies, where the presence of God actually was. And, and God who is absolutely holy, zero darkness, no sin. There was no light in that little place that little section of the temple. God himself is that light. Well, there was this thick kind of veil or curtain that separated man and all our efforts to try and reach God's presence. There was still this veil. There was still this separation between us and our sinfulness and God and God's presence. But the only place on planet earth that you could find the actual living presence of God's manifest presence was there in that temple. And the reason it existed is because God longed to dwell among His people. He longed to presence Himself among His people. God didn't desire building to live in. It was never His plan. When Jesus came, things began to change. And if we see where things are going, you'll see in Revelation 21, verse 22 to 23, it says that I did not see a temple in the city. The way things are going to be in the future is that the whole of redeemed creation will be the temple of God. Does that make sense? All that God is going to redeem. When He makes all things new and He, he deals with sin and death and everything else, that God Himself will be present everywhere. His manifest presence will be there. As it tells us, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb is uh, are its temple. And the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its, is its lamp. Isn't that amazing? 
Moses himself said, what else distinguishes us as a, as a community, as a people, other than that the presence of God is here? Do you know that in the Old Testament, there was a time in Ezekiel's time when the presence of God left the temple. And during Jesus' ministry, they were busy rebuilding that temple. You can remember that in John chapter 2, verse 20. And it was breathtaking. They had been building for 46 years by the time Jesus lived. Remember the disciples are saying, look at this amazing building. Look at this amazing. In fact, if you've gone to Jerusalem and you hadn't seen the building, it was like the beauty and the splendor of God. You hadn't seen Jerusalem. And yet Jesus said, no, this is like a den of robbers. It was a religious outward system with none of the glory and the presence of God there. In fact, when Jesus died... The, the veil was ripped from top to bottom. It was like God left the house. Done living in a building. What's amazing is that they must have sewn that curtain together and hung it back because, you know, it was, that temple kept operating until 70 AD when the Romans actually came and plundered Jerusalem. It's just holding together a, a shell of religion with nothing of the glory and the presence of God there. Until Jesus went, after the resurrection, went to the Father and the Holy Spirit came and the presence of God is now in the people of God. We become this new temple in which God lives. Isn't that amazing? This glorious God lives in, in his people. And so not only are we the bride of Jesus, but we're also this temple that carry the very presence of God wherever we go in our togetherness. In Corinthians, Paul says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? Where does God live on earth? Among his people. Always been his plan always been his desire we don't come into the house of god to experience his presence his presence now lives in the hearts and the minds of his people together that's why we gather that's why we worship because as we gather the called out ones the ones that gather together in his name the ones that have been redeemed the ones that have the promises of god so also we are the ones where the presence of god lives and that distinguishes us from all other people the people of God. We need to see the church like that again. With a temple in which God lives by His Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> the third thing about the, the, the church that's amazing is that we are called the body of Christ. That's it. It's not quite it. There's a bit more. But Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 15. I'm hoping you just, like, I'm hoping we renew our minds about the community that God's created us for. Yes, you have a purpose and there's, there's a call on your life, but it cannot be outside of the collective call God has for His people to be His bride, to carry His presence, and to be His body. What a fantastic idea that somehow we are connected to Christ and, and we are His members of His body here on this earth. Ephesians 4 verse 11. Um, Christ's purpose is to equip His people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and knowledge in the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And we'll grow um, to become, grow up, to become, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. Do you know that when, uh, I'm just ignoring that, that's old. That's so yesterday. And you put it on the screen as well, so I'm not, I'm not looking there. Um, when Paul persecuted the, the church, can you remember that? And on the way to Damascus, he had letters 
to he was pulling people anyone who belonged to the church it says that he would go with letters to to take them put them into prison and then jesus knocks him off his donkey remember that and he says so so why are you persecuting it's an amazing revelation paul has there that the church is jesus it's the body of christ it's the body of Christ. You persecute the church, you persecute Christ. That's the revelation Paul has here. The church is the, the body of Christ. We have to just renew our minds a little bit about the community of God. You know, um, I think many people would, would say, like, oh, if only Jesus was here in the flesh, it would be so helpful. I think Jesus, as much as I, I, I understand that, there's times I would want that too. Jesus said, it's better for me to go so that I can send the Holy Spirit so He can come. It's like having His Spirit in us. We know His thoughts. We know His minds. His mind. We have His power in us and we can be His hands and His feet as He as the head is leading the church. What a thing. What a thing. What Jesus wants from us is partnership. I think it is um, C.S. Lewis who said that, you know, God delegates everything that, uh, that he, all the things that he himself can do that he, he, he huh? thank you. God <laughs> seems to do nothing of himself. That's exactly what I wanted to say which he can possibly delegate to his creatures. He commands us to slowly and blutteringly what he could, to do slowly and blutteringly what he could perfectly do in a twinkling of an eye. For me, the point is that there's nothing that God doesn't delegate to us that we can't do, that he, he himself, even in his patience, would allow us to flop and do it again and not do it perfectly. He prefers to, to find partnership with us. And so I think many times when we travel, we go to other churches, we go to other nations, and I think like, Lord, you could do this on your own. You don't need, you don't need us. You don't need me. And yet God is committed to like delegate that to us. So I've given you that task, given you that job. And sometimes I think like, Lord, you could do a much better job. God says, I'm committed to partnership. I'm committed to working through the church. Someone said this, I think it's Dudley Daniel who said, there is no plan B. God doesn't have a plan B. The church is his plan, and he's sticking to his plan. Until Jesus comes back, that's the plan. Many people today look at the church and say, oh my goodness, Lord, is this it? Yes, that's his plan. And he can make it work because he's the head. He makes it beautiful because he is the one that shows grace and mercy and helps her to do it. So I love that about Jesus, that he gives us the task, go and make disciples of all nations, and then he says, I am with you. I'm with you. Could have done it himself. Delegates it to us. So let's, what's the implications of this? And there are many other pictures of the church that you can look at in the Bible, but for me, those are so crucial to understand that we are the bride of Christ. He's coming back for a radiant bride. We're the temple. We carry the presence of God. We're the body. Many times the body is dysfunctional. But he's making her more functional. He's equipping her. He's empowering her. He's telling her how to go about it. And, and he himself is presencing himself there. What does this mean? Well, number one, never lose hope for the church. all her failures and all her flaws i want to say he's at work in her he's committed to her and when you're discouraged by her failures and flaws i encourage you to lean into the inexhaustible love of jesus for her you know what i mean people i know people are disappointed by the church number one i think our picture of the church is incorrect but even if we are disappointed by the church we lean into Jesus and the fact that he so loves her, that he shows grace to her, he goes and finds her, he brings her back, he restores her, he loves her. He, like we read in Ezekiel, he cleanses her, he makes her stand. He makes her stand. The problem and I think the challenge 
of the bride of Jesus is that, you know, over the centuries we have this kind of promiscuous heart that, that often we, we, we give ourselves and we're seduced by the power of the world and, and money and love for, for position and, and all these things. And we, we kind of, you know, commit adultery with the things that are very much the enemies of Christ. But somehow Jesus doesn't give up on her. Somehow he goes and finds her. Somehow he cleanses her. Somehow he restores her again. It's a beautiful thing. And for whatever reason, whatever beauty he sees in her, if we understand that, that she's his bride, I think we can see that beauty also and value the church the way he does. You know that the things that you probably hate about the church and her failures and mess-ups, you yourself have been guilty of that as well. I know that. We often criticize the church for things that we ourselves do. And that's why I love this thing that we can understand that we are the church. We don't go to church because often people will say the church should be doing that. Exactly. Well, this church isn't praying enough. Exactly. Well, you are the church. We are the church. Together we are. And so if that's the case, we... Did you miss in the church? It's okay. It's okay. People online are wondering what's going on here. It's amazing, hey? It's amazing. You know, for us, uh, we've had the privilege of traveling to all, all kinds of places. And whether there's five or six people gathered in a, a small hut in Mozambique somewhere sharing one tea bag, whether you go to a glitzy building with sound and what, she's beautiful. She's beautiful. And he loves her. And he can make her stand. And when she goes wrong, he has a way of drawing her back to himself. And so I'm asking us, don't give up hope for the church. She got mistakes, yes. The reason we we believe in it is because he believes in it. Amen. We were created for community. That's our purpose. Quickly to end off. The, the, so the first implication, the first thing I'm asking you is, you know, don't, don't, don't be too quick. When you're speaking against the church, you're speaking against his bride. Remember that. With all her flaws and faults, I get it. Remember, it's the temple, and it's the body of Jesus. And so I'm asking you, don't give up hope. Is that okay? Secondly, use your gifts to strengthen its ministries. And uh, again, Ephesians, each one should use whatever gift you have. Can you say each one? Each one. Every one of us have something that we can do to build up the church. And you know when we build up the church, actually I had this here. I've got... um, I got some maluti. This is 20 maluti. Can you see it? It's not rands. I had to give rands to get maluti. I had to make an exchange. Now, here in South Africa, here in Durban, this is pretty useless. Not worth much. But if I go to that, they call it the kingdom of Lesotho. Because it has a king. When I go there, this has value. And I think about that scripture where Jesus says, you know, store up treasures for yourself in heaven where moth and rust can't, can't steal. And, and can't steal and destroy. I got home late last night. I think to myself, the way that we exchange what's temporary for eternal is often when we love the things Jesus loves. And when you love the church and when you serve the church and when you build up the church, you're building up the very body of Christ. In fact, the scripture says not even giving someone a glass of water. Because they're a disciple goes unnoticed. That is like amazing. Jesus will literally sit you down in eternity and say, thank you for serving my bride 
with that glass of water. It's recorded. Not in vain. Many people think like, you know, come and serve the church. No, come and serve Jesus. Use the gift that you have to build up the body. Why? Because the people are worthy. No, because He's worthy. Exchange some of your, your temporary stuff, which you all, it will all be gone anyway when He comes. And it will be absolutely worthless. Exchange it for some heavenly currency. I wonder how much treasure we stored up there. Now, I want to say this, the best way we store up treasure, I mean, thank you, Uncle Segi. Great is your reward in heaven. <laughs> Great illustration. Honestly, that, that's why I... I mean, we've seen his bride at her worst, at her ugliest, behaving unlike him, not following his ways. We've seen that. If you're put off by that, I think we've got to renew our minds a bit. He's committed to her. We've got no plan B. She's beautiful to him. And we don't see the people. We see Jesus through the people. And so I really want to encourage you. The scripture says each one of us has something we can give. That together we can show the world the manifold wisdom of God. And the glory of God in His people. You know, relationships is beautiful. Community doesn't happen. I am on a community group. No, no. Without Christ as the head and without us having the same history where we rescued and we have the promises of God over our lives together, there's not much that unifies us. We go back to our culture, our language, what we think we, people should become like us, and then we can be community. But in the church, it's amazing. I go up to um, Lesotho yesterday, and that, uh, that friend of mine who's a Basotho man, his son lost the baby on, when did we drive up? Friday. I weep with him as if he's my brother. How is that possible? Outside of Christ, we have no history even. Where he stays, where he lives, I, I, we have no connection, no history. And yet we are like family together because we've been saved and we have common promises for the future. It's a beautiful thing. So I give myself to that. I want to encourage you, man. There's something in the church that also God is calling you to do. Build up the church. Use your gifts. Amen. Two more. If we understand that the church is the bride of Christ, the temple and the body of Christ, then we, use, uh, 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 then we don't write her off. We use our gifts to strengthen her. And thirdly, we prioritize our worship together, our small group gatherings. I want to say get connected somehow. The reason we have teams, the reason we do things in groups is so that we can grow together. The word ecclesia means the call down ones. And I know in our individualistic kind of, I don't know, Western culture, it's so, so easy to give up the discipline of gathering together. And I'm sure there are many, many reasons. It's raining. There's sports. I don't know. You've got to go and cycle. There's so many other things. I'm saying, guys, girls, this is important that we gather together. It's important that we spend time together. We have to be intentional and do it regularly to grow together. Amen. And lastly, love the whole church. Those four things is what I'm asking you. When Jesus comes back, he's not coming back for the Anglicans only, the Pentecostals, the Catholics, the Charismatics, the United Church of God in the central. <laughs> and live, yeah, he's coming back for, you know, more, more, more than I do. He's coming back for one people, one people, one bride. And if you have that understanding, you're cautious to criticize other churches. I'm just saying, we speak well of each other. We believe the best of each other. 
I'm not saying we have to agree with everything. But city life is not the best church, you know. It's the church God's put you in. It's best for you. She has faults. She has flaws. And you know, we need every local church to be able to get the job done. You know that. Every, there's, there's more work than we can handle. So pray for, rejoice, love. Love all of God's people. That should be our attitude. Rather than just see church as like, it's just us. Amen? We praise God for the gospel being preached in other regions, other nations. Just like this, God is doing all over the world. And we are part of that. If we have that understanding, we realize we're one family. Like every family has got some quirky cousins and, you know, got their <laughs> Every family has got, you know, you, you know, maybe you're that person. I don't know. <laughs> Look, I don't want to involve myself in the discussions because I've got my own family, my own family. But we realize we are one family. We realize under Jesus Christ we have one head. And so we're cautious to, to, to shoot down people we don't know and we don't even know their lives and we don't know what's going on. I don't think it's good. We don't involve ourselves in discussions of people we don't even live with and know. And now that's consuming our time. I think it's completely unhelpful. If it's a family meeting, it's about the head. And what he's doing with us and in us. And, and how he's uniting us in the mission. And what he's called us to. And how can we show off his glory and his, display his wisdom to the world. That plenty time to talk about that. Not to talk about cousin so-and-so who's doing something we think they shouldn't do. Amen? We can't float around. Let me just say this. I can't. Tonight I'm staying by Michael's place. And then I'm by Jacob's place. And then one night by Craig's place. And that's my family. You know, try that. It doesn't work. <laughs> I'm coming. Maybe I'm coming. I have a family. Do you know what I mean? That's where I'm committed. That's where I'm accountable. With my faults and flaws and everything, it's not because we're perfect that we're together. God put us together. And you need to make that, that decision. Ask God the question and then settle in it and just move on with it. But we seem to have a culture where people are going around saying, like, what's the kids' ministry like? What's the preaching like? What's this like? What's that? And I can choose... What the, it's like we are service providers and you want to get the best value for money. You know what I mean? I was like, it's ridiculous. It's not how it works. God puts you in the tribe of Benjamin. Good luck finding a piece of land in Naphtali. He chose. He put you. It's been my, I've only been in three churches my whole life. Can you believe it? I've been saved since I'm 16. One the pastor committed adultery. Disaster. Who said what? <laughs> I shouldn't say who the church is. Yeah, I was just like, I'm just saying. But I got saved there. I radically saved. I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I know God can do anything. He can use anything. Even imperfect churches. Let me just say, the God can use them because God can use them. I don't move and jump and until he says he's the head, that's where I stay. If he says move, I move. Amen. Got to change the, the church culture a little bit. And say, Lord, if you put me here, there's a reason. There's something I need to learn here. Uh, I, I was saying to the guys in Lesotho, you know, um, when we were at Lighthouse, I was like, Lord, sheesh. I know I'm here because these people really need us to be here. And I felt the Lord rebuked me. And he said, no, no, you, you need them. <laughs> you need them. Okay. <laughs> he put me there because there's some stuff I still need to change. So you guys are stuck with me until I'm changing. No, let's stand. No. <laughs> Settle it in your heart. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. 
God's purpose is for us to be in community. He created us like that. His community where he is the head. Lord Jesus, thank you for the privilege of relationships and friends and community. Thank you that we are your bride. What a privilege. I want to be passionate about you again. Worship you with passion, Lord. Love to be together and sing your name. Pray and worship and encourage each other. Lord, if we've written off your bride in any way, we say we're sorry. Forgive us, Lord. She belongs to you. She stands and falls to you, not to us. Lord, if we've given up hope in church, and just what's the point of coming together? What's the point? Forgive us, Lord. There is a point to it. It's your body. It's where the gifts operate. And Lord Jesus, we pray today, Lord God, will you strengthen us? Will you show your glory to Durban through City Life? Lord, through every gospel preaching church, would you show off your wisdom and your power and your ability to forgive and restore and show grace? Will you show it to the world? through city life, wherever you put us, in every, every community represented here, from South Beach, Lord God, to Mshloti, to Inland, to Phoenix, you scattered us across the city because you've given city life to the city. And other churches, you've, you've given them to the city to show your wisdom and your glory. Help us, Lord God, to be those witnesses who show off your light and your glory to the world. In Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you at prayer at 6.30 on Tuesday. Please stay for coffee and tea and whatever. And don't forget to fetch your children downstairs. If you don't fetch them, they will go into lost property.